<clears throat> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. My one hearted open greetings to each and every one of you. My love to each and every one of you. And I send the love of my Sheikh Muhammad Rahim Bao Muhayyadeen to each and every one of you. Our Sheikh spent a lifetime telling us about the wonders of the Creator, telling us about the wonders of God, and instilling in us a love for that God, a respect for that God, and a desire to become integrated with that God. He explained to us the nature of that God. God is a complete plentitude. He has no need for anything. He has no need for nourishment. He has no need for growth. He has no need for expansion. He is complete and plentiful. And no matter how much you may draw from him, no matter how much you may take from him, in no way ever diminished. He doesn't need nourishment, but he provides nourishment for all of his creations, all of his creations that he created in this world. Our souls receive nourishment from God. God gives nourishment as part of his duty, as part of what it is that he does. He provides nourishment for each and everything. And he provides for us. And he gives us the ability to transform and transcend and to become more. And what does it mean to become more? It means to become complete. Complete how? to become complete in the way that he is complete. So that man can go from ordinary man to what is known as insan kamal, or perfected man. And following that trajectory, to go on to that state which is known as man, God, God, man, where man integrates the qualities of God within him and leaves behind all the other qualities. If one is capable of reciting La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illallahu, La ilaha illallah, I do not exist, only God exists. And if one can do that with sincerity, in reality, and that in fact occurs, that the self is given up, then man has reached his completeness. If you can open up your mouth and actually say those words, then your mouth is full of wisdom. Then your mouth is complete within wisdom. Then your mouth knows what is and what isn't, and you know what is and what isn't. God's grace and qualities are his perfection and his treasury. And the Ketub is the vibration of analytic wisdom. It is that which explains to all of the universe, it explains to humanity, reality. That is 
what the ketub is. And within <clears throat> my lifetime, I lived with a ketub. I lived with analytic wisdom. I lived with the explainer of reality. I had access to him in a bodily form. And this is truly a miracle within existence. Imagine having before you truth in form that can explain to you what truth is, what reality is, and <clears throat> how to understand that truth so that you can differentiate between that which is reality and that which is illusion. Man has physical vision. He sees things with his eyes. And man takes this physical vision and understands or sees aspects of the world with it. He then transfers these visions that he has to his intellect. Intellect gives it to man's memory. Memory brings it into thought. And all of the thoughts that we have become a dream world. And with dreams comes darkness, like in a movie. And you see these dreams. And these dreams become your birth in the world. And this is the life that you lead. This dream world that has come from your physical visions that have become ensconced within you as your memory patterns that you repeat over and over. In our path towards reality, we have to be able to erase all of these visions that have turned eventually into thoughts that have become our patterns that have created a dream world for us that we call reality. This reality, based on physical visions, <clears throat> is a reality that is based in form and is filtered through our own mind and desire. And we go on living within this dream world as if it were real. But there is a reality beyond this dream world, and we have to learn what that reality is. And we have to learn how to enter that reality. But to be able to enter that reality, we have to learn how to leave the dream world that we've accepted as our birth and as our truth. Because in fact, it is not true. It is illusion. There is another reality that is the real reality. And simply, that which deals with form, that which deals with the world, that which deals with the thought of the world, is illusion. And reality deals with the qualities that are God, and the yearning for God. In order for the transformation 
to begin. From living in a dream world and entering reality, we have to develop inner patience. We have to develop inner contentment. We have to develop inner trust. And we must, with great determination and certitude, believe that God exists. You see, if you don't believe that God exists, you will continue to live in the dream world and you will not enter into the kingdom that belongs to God. So as we contemplate the fact that God exists, as we sit with patience, and contentment as we sit with love for our creator we must release the satanic qualities that we have picked up over the course of our lifetime and that have become a part of our dream world we must release the anger that we have picked up anger is the guru of sin we must release the lusts that we've picked up. The lusts are bigger than the ocean. We must give up all of the qualities that are not sublime. We must give up all of the qualities that are not transcendent. We must give up all of the qualities that we used to manipulate the material world, the elemental world, to gain footholds within the elemental world. We must give up thievery. We must give up murder. We must give up lying. We must give up all of the qualities that we felt would help us progress within that world. And we have to replace all of that in the beginning with doing duty. Duty comes to us as a grace from God. Duty comes to us as something that's given to us to help us make the transition from the dream world into the world of reality. When we can begin to understand that the hunger of others is the same of, as our hunger, we have begun to make the transition from the dream world, from the world of illusion, into the world of reality. The quality of duty is a grace from God. We must know others' hungers. We must know others' sadness. We must understand that their sadness is the same as our sadness. That there is a unity amongst men that is real, that exists to the point where all of us have an equality within us. And as we begin to understand that, then we begin to understand more and more about the truth of creation as opposed to the dream of creation. You see, the dream of creation, the illusion of creation has us as the center of it it is an egocentric belief system that we are somehow individuated and this individuation is at the core of the illusory dreamlike understanding of things once we lose the attachment to that 
paradigm. Once we lose the attachment to that belief system, once we begin to understand about the unity of all mankind, we begin to leave the dream and enter into reality. If you plant a seed, you have to fertilize it. You have to pour water on it. You have to take care of it. And you have to look closely to make sure that it grows. Now, <clears throat> when you plant the seed, you don't ask the earth for the water back that you put on the seed. You don't ask the earth for the fertilizer that you put on the seed. In the same way, when you do duty towards someone, when you help someone, you don't look for a reward. You don't look for something in return. You don't look for profit. You do it out of the grace that comes from your Lord. We must be able to look at each one that we see who comes into our purview and be able to do duty towards them as is necessary. And to do this correctly, we can have absolutely no prejudice in our heart. We have to be in a space where we see no differences. There's no differences of color. There's no differences of race. There's no differences of religion. There's no differences of language. There is no differences. We must learn how to do duty towards each other without blood ties, without having favorites dependent on our cultural background, without having favorites depending on our religious background, without having favorites depending on our racial background or depending on our language background. God speaks all languages. God knows all hearts. God knows all religions. God is looking for those who will turn towards him, no matter what language that they speak. And God continues to do duty towards every one of his creations and continues to provide nourishment towards every one of his creations. We likewise, in order to be, be able to make the transition from living in the illusory world of dreams to living in the reality of God's kingdom, have to make the transition where we have given up self-motive, where we have given up the individuation of ourself as separate from everyone else, the individuation of ourself where our religion is separate from everyone else, where our race is separate from everyone else, where our color is separate from everyone else, where our culture is separate from everyone else, where our <clears throat> cultural ideas are separate from everyone else. We have to give up these ideas. We have to give up the ideas of race. We have to give up the ideas of caste. We have to give up the ideas of religion. We have to give up the separations that exist because of these ideas. God does his duty with unity and with love. We have to do our duty with unity and love. We have to understand that duty is done with unity and love. And unity means bringing everyone in and understanding that everyone is in 
whether we believe that or not. That is reality. So there is reality, and there are the tenets of reality. And we have to begin to accept the tenets that are reality. And when we begin to accept those tenets, that's part of our trust in God. That's part of our belief in God. If we truly believe in God, then we have no prejudice. But if we believe in God with prejudice, we don't believe in God. If we believe in God in separate religious enclaves and say no one else is God's child, we don't believe in God. We have created our own idea of reality, and we insist on that idea of reality as being truth, when in fact it isn't truth. And we cannot believe false ideas and still transcend into truth. So we have to give up all of our ideas. We have to give up all that we have held dear and sacred up to this moment when the truth has been revealed to us. When we say, I do not exist, only God exists. It means I do not exist and all my ideas do not exist. I do not exist and all of my relations do not exist. I do not exist and everything I held as important does not exist. I do not exist and my fame does not exist. I do not exist and my power does not exist. I do not exist and my religious preferences do not exist. I do not exist and my blood ties do not exist. I do not exist and my language doesn't exist. I do not exist. <clears throat> Which means that we can't hold on to anything. To be able to become complete is only to become God-like. And when we say, la ilaha illallah, I do not exist, only God exists. There must be a total rejection of that self-existence. And to reject the self is a very difficult thing to do. To take on the need of self-annihilation is a very, very difficult thing to do. But as we come closer to understanding that everything else is a lie and everything else leads to destruction, we begin to understand that in truth, we have no choice. Where does religious difference take us? It takes us to war. Where does country difference take us? It takes us to war. Where does language difference take us? It takes us to war. Almost everything that we hold on to, that we consider important, ends up being in a state of war eventually, and then we pick sides. <laughs> And we become more entrenched in our point of view than we ever were before. Are we capable of living in this world not being attached to the material aspects of this world? Are we capable of living in this world not being attached to the religious ideas of this world? Are we capable 
of living in this world transcending all of the differences that exist in this world? Or do we attach ourselves to the differences and those differences become our life? In reality, in God's reality, there is only unity. There are no differences. In this world, there are constant differences. And if we choose to attach ourselves to these differences, then we choose to attach ourselves to illusion. And if we attach ourselves to illusion, then we are making ourselves susceptible to a life of difficulty and sadness and a life of trauma because we become involved in all the trauma that exists within the world. Look at the elemental nature of existence and look at the trauma of the elemental nature of existence. Look at hurricanes. Look at tornadoes. Look at all of the physical eruptions that occur within the makeup of this created world. Earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, fires, all of these things happen because this world is not stable. The elements are not stable. The elements are averse to each other and often come into conflict. Likewise, within our body, we are made up of the elements and the elements are not stable within our body. And eventually, this instability of the elemental forces within our body dissipates and the body dissipates the body dies the body goes on and if we each of us have chosen to associate ourselves with the body then at the death of the body we are subject to rebirth we are subject to repeating the same game we play over and over and over again. Is that our intention? Or is our intention to transcend this physical existence and enter into the kingdom of light where all of the differences that exist within the physical realm, exist within the elemental realm, exist within the realm of mind and desire, exist within the dream world that is created out of our physical visions and memories, do we wish to transcend that? Or do we wish because of what our parents told us or our teachers told us or our friends told us or the belief systems that surround us, do we wish to tie ourselves to those belief systems and hold them up as real, even though as we come closer to knowing the truth, we realize they're not real. We realize there is no reality to them. There is no substance to them. They change with the wind. They change with the temperature. They change constantly, yet man holds on to them as if they are eternal. There is nothing eternal within this material world. And when we realize there is nothing eternal 
within this material world. We begin to realize that we have to make ourselves attached to that which is in fact eternal. Look at the qualities that are in the Asma al-Husna, the names of Allah. Compassion is not a material thing. Mercy is not a material thing. Love is not a material thing. But when you look at love, what is stronger in your life than love? What gives you a higher sense of joy and truth than love? Is love worth more than wealth? Is love worth more than fame? Is love worth more than cars? What is worth more than love? What is worth more than being in that state of the ecstasy that exists when one is in love? And what is the highest form of love? The highest form of love is the love that we have for our creator. And through that love for our creator, we can join into the world of light and the kingdom that belongs to God. And all of this begins for us when we begin to understand that as opposed to spending our lifetime working on behalf of ourselves, we should be spending our lifetime working on behalf of doing God's work. And doing God's work is to do duty onto others, to do duty onto his creation, to assist those in his creation. When we enter into that phase where we transcend our self-motive, we begin to transcend into his kingdom. Transcending self-motive transcends us into his kingdom. Transcending prejudice transcends us into his kingdom. Transcending religion transcends us into his kingdom. Transcending blood ties, the ties that we have with our relatives, transcends us into his kingdom. Transcending race transcends us into his kingdom kingdom. Transcending language transcends us into his kingdom. Transcending prejudice transcends us into his kingdom. Transcending ourselves transcends us into his kingdom. So we have to begin to do the work of service. Now, my sheikh was an example of this. He spent his entire life on behalf of other people. He came here on behalf of other people. Everything he did was on behalf of other people. He had no time for himself because he had no need to do anything for himself. He had no needs. Allah was sufficient for him. But in this world, Allah isn't sufficient. Not only is Allah not sufficient, we have placed in front of us things before Allah. Religion becomes before Allah. Wealth becomes before Allah. Power becomes before Allah. Control becomes before Allah. There can be nothing before Allah. And 
that's when we begin to understand that through God's power, we understand the duty that God does. And if we understand the duty that God does towards all of his creation, then we begin to understand the duty that we have to do towards Allah's creation. If we can't do this duty in the way that Allah does this duty, then we are constantly subject to living within the dream world based on our vision and our mind. And our mind doesn't understand reality. Our mind only understands the limited nature of our physical involvement in this material world. We have to be able to become expansive beyond that. And that's why we need the Ketub in our life. That's why we need analytic wisdom to explain to us that which is real and that which isn't real. And we have to accept that which is real and deny that which isn't real. So again, we do not exist. Only God exists. And if only God exists, then all of the petty squabbles that we're involved in don't exist. All of the petty problems that we're involved in don't exist. All of the petty worldviews that we carry with us don't exist. And when we learn how to give them up, then we become open to understanding Allah and Allah's qualities. Allah <clears throat> is so generous to us that he has allowed us to share in his compassion. He has allowed us to share in his mercy. He has allowed us to share in his love. And can you imagine any treasure in this world of a material nature or of any nature that's greater than Allah's treasures, that's greater than coming to know Allah's qualities and having those qualities incorporated in you so that you become at one with them. This is our goal. This is the purpose for our existence. Our creator created us so that we could come to know him. But instead, we've decided to come to know the world. Instead, we've decided to come to know material things. Instead, we've decided to come to know how our mind works and why it works in the way it does in order to create this dream world for us. And we've decided to live in this dream world and flourish in this dream world and somehow conquer this dream world. The dream world can't be conquered. You will end your life trying to conquer the dream world and you'll come back to a new dream world. We must set the intention to leave the dream world and enter into the truth, which is God's kingdom. And that is a world of unity and a world where there are no differences and there are no differentiations. There is but one. May it come to pass that we all understand that one, that Allah opens our hearts so that we know that one and we integrate with that one. May that be our fate. May that happen for each of us that we come to know that truth, come to know that one, come to be with that one, and become of that one. Amin, amin. Ya Rabbi Lalameen, assalamu alaikum, rahmatullah wa barakatuh.